Well, here I am again, getting to bring God's Word to you this morning, and as always, I am humbled and honored to be able to do so. Um, I will share with you, this message has been a tough one for me. Uh, This one has been challenging. If you look at the bulletin, you see the passage is Romans 6. Now, how foolish is that, to try and do Romans 6 in a single Sunday morning message? Uh, But we will will figure out how we're going to do that as we get going, but... But I've, I've, I've often talked about how hard it is to, to get up here and to bring one message, to get one opportunity to, to, to expound upon God's word and, and hit some powerful truths, and it really is challenging. There are so many things that I would love to share with all of you, uh, so many lessons the Lord has faithfully taught me uh, and brought me through, uh, ways in which he has challenged me, and and it's, it's tough not to just go, oh, here's something, and I'm just going to share this. And, and I had one of those moments uh, in leading up to preparing to teach this morning. Um, a gentleman in our church, actually I think he's in here somewhere, Al Gilbertson, had posted on his Facebook um, kind of a quote from a newsletter article I'd written back in 2013. Um, and so I, I was tagged in it, and so I saw the quote, and I happened to be at the hospital with uh, a dear St. Pat Kingston and her husband, Will, when I found it and I was sharing with her, I said, you know, I think I may preach on this um, as I was thinking about it. And I read it to her and she goes, you said that? And I go, yes, Pat, I said that. I'm like, why so surprised, you know? But um, I, I'm going to share with you what that was about. I'm not going to preach on it, but I just felt the need to at least throw it out there for you because I was really encouraged by it. And so it came out of a passage of scripture in the Gospels. It's as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the passage says, and behold, One of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal 12 12 legions of angels? And uh, as I was contemplating that passage in, in the newsletter article, I, I made the, the point that it's, it's so interesting not to think about the fact that Jesus had the power and the authority to call down 12 legions of angels, but it said he chose not to. You know, for us, when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances and challenging times, and if we have the ability to remove those challenges or those circumstances, how many of us don't do it? I know I do. I jump at the opportunity to get out of those difficult times. And so I share that with you this morning, just as some food for thought, uh, to to think about maybe those areas in life where we're avoiding going through some tough things that the Lord has for us. Because Christ knew what was ahead of him was painful and was difficult, but served a beautiful purpose. He would be willing to go through the tough times. But we're not covering that this morning. We're not talking about that. I didn't feel like it was fair. It's not really the point of that passage of Scripture, so I wasn't going to go and do that whole thing. Uh, But instead, I've chosen to talk about something that I have had many conversations with folks about over the years, uh, many difficult conversations with folks uh, about. And and to be honest, I'm not sure I always handled those conversations well. I think that there are times in which I've missed the mark in talking about the issue found in Romans 6, and really the issue is sin. We're going to be talking about sin this morning, Um, but more specifically, what does it mean to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus? That's that's the message that that we are given in Romans chapter 6. I'm going to do something a little different, a little out of the norm. I'm going to read all of chapter Romans chapter 6 for us. Uh, I know it's a lot. I'm going to ask you to hang with me, but I think it's important that we hear the fullness of, of the context of what is going on here. So follow along, starting in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too 
might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just come to you right now and ask that you would grant us eyes to see and ears to hear and understanding as we consider these amazing truths that have been laid out for us in your word. Father, help us to, to hear and to receive and to be changed and transformed as a result. May the work that you have accomplished in us in calling us to yourselves be completed in the work of sanctification, bringing us to glorification. Father, we long to see you. And we pray that you would use the truths of your word to shape us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So Romans 6 is a huge chunk of Scripture, and there is no way that we are going to be able to, to pull it apart verse by verse this morning. And so we're going to be taking more of a kind of a big picture approach to this chapter of Scripture. There are so many wonderful, uh, deep doctrines in, in the, the book of Romans as a whole. Uh, Romans is one of those books that I avoided teaching on for a number of years. I think, I, I say out of a healthy fear, uh, a healthy fear of misrepresenting the Lord, uh, of not honoring Him, because these, these truths are so powerful and so life-changing. Truths such as man's sin, truths such as God's wrath, the security of our salvation, God's work of justification, the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believers, and even sanctification, which is really the, 
the hallmark of chapter 6 that we're going to be discussing this morning. This chapter starts with Paul asking a question. He knew that this question would be posed by the Romans um, because of what he had just said previously. And so as we look into chapter 6, and as though that were not enough, we must now go into chapter 5 briefly. We've got to see what Paul said at the end of chapter 5 to raise this question that starts chapter 6 for us. So look at chapter 5, starting in verse 20. He says, The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The phrase found in there, law came in so that the transgression would increase, can seem difficult at first glance. But the point is simple. Where there is no law, there is no sin. Paul says it again in Romans 7, 7. He puts it a little bit of a different way. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. You see, the law was given to to bring to light and to expose our sinfulness to us. We were made aware of, of truth and of right and wrong to show us how much we miss the mark, how often we sin. The law was there to expose our sin. And, and as believers, that should help to make us even more keenly aware of the extent of God's grace poured out in our lives, right? As we understand more of our sinfulness, we get a better glimpse of His grace poured out. But unfortunately, oftentimes, exposure to the law, exposure to rules, often leads also to serve and lead us into sin. That's just the reality. As I was going through my studies this week, I came across a a story about a pastor who had decided he wanted his people to to see this vast list of sins specific sins that are laid out for us in the scripture. He came up with 65 specific sins that are addressed in God's word. And so he decided on a Sunday morning he was going to get up. There was just a little bit of worship through music and everything. And then he goes, there's no real sermon. I'm just going to stand here and read 65 different sins. And he read them to the congregation on a Sunday morning. Later that week, he received a note from one of the the his congregants at the church, and the note said, Pastor, I just want to thank you so much for sharing that list with us. He says, it was really eye-opening. There were many sins that I had not even known were sins. I look forward to trying them. (laughs) The exposure of things that we didn't even know were wrong sometimes now kind of gets our mind going, oh, that could be interesting, and we go down paths. And that's exactly what took place here. And and the law exposed our sin, exposed all the the ways in which we we sin against our holy God. All that to say that the statement at the end of chapter 5 is one that would lead to a natural question, right? It would lead to the question that starts chapter 6. Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? And it garners an immediate response from Paul. He says, may it never be. No way. But why not? Hey, if grace is made more of when I sin, then don't we want people to see more grace? Isn't grace a good thing? That's, that's the path that people naturally go down. He goes on to say, how shall we who die to sin still live in it? See, the point he's saying is, no, 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 no. You are a child of God. You have put your faith in him. How have you who died to sin still live in it? It can't be. Galatians 2.20 puts it this way. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Or in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3, which say, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The rest of verses 1 through 7 here in chapter 6 speak of the fact that because of our relationship with Christ, he is speaking to believers here. He's saying you are children of God. Because you are children of God, you are dead to sin. You are dead to sin. Look again at verse 6. He says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. This is the verse where we find the title of our message this morning. We are no longer slaves to sin. And we must understand how important this is that we are no longer slaves to sin. That statement naturally infers that there was a time in which we once were slaves to sin. If we are no longer slaves, we at one point were slaves. Sin ruled and reigned in our life. There was a time in which we had no real power or choice over sin. It had all the power over us. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. We were enemies of a holy God. But if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if we believe that he died on the cross to make payment for our sins, if we believe that he rose again on the third day, showing his power and victory over the grave and over death, then we have been cleansed and we are no longer slaves to sin. Prior to our salvation, we had no real ability to do good, which means that sin is a quality that characterized our life. We were slaves to sin. We had no real choice but to obey the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. That's who we were, that's where we lived. Sin no longer is what characterizes us, however. As believers, we no longer have to obey the leadings of sin. Verse 7 even goes so far as to say that we are freed from sin. The language he uses, we are freed from sin. This is where I think the universal church as a whole has done a massive disservice to individuals in the body of Christ. I think that we have, have left people in a place of hopelessness. We've left people in a place where they just think, I'm I'm just going to sin for the rest of my life. Sin has power over me. I can't can't get away from it. I can't escape it. You guys, that's a lie from the pit of hell. That is not what God's word has to say. And I stand here and I tell you this. I, I have experienced freedom from sin. I have experienced victory over sin in my life. I was an alcoholic for eight years of my life. I started drinking at a young age. And December 25th, 1998 was the end. 20 years coming up this month of sobriety. That is a work of God. That is a work of God. Sin is no longer what characterizes us. The power of sin over us is not what what we are stuck with. But I I do have to admit, there are times in which I had conversations with people where where I just kind of left them in that place of hope. I was just like, you're going to struggle your whole life. Sin's just going to be there, you know? And, and, And I think that's missing the mark. That's not the way that our relationship to sin is described in God's Word, especially not here in Romans 6. Romans 6 is described very different. Look again, verse 8. He says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, good words, even so, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
God's word is encouraging us to consider ourselves, to see ourselves, to think about ourselves as dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That phrase, even so, at the beginning of verse 11, connects us to that once for all that Christ experienced. That once for all completed, done, even so, you are dead to sin. Completed, done. That work is is finished, and we are no longer slaves to sin, which must mean that any relationship that we still have with sin today is one of our own making. It's one of our own choosing. We're no longer slaves to it. It doesn't have power or authority over us, but we can still choose to walk in it. That's a sobering thought. That's a scary thought. That's why we need to look, continue down, verse 12, 12 through 14. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. See, verse 12 begins with a therefore. We know that that means we have to look back at what came right before it. The statement that connects those two things. He is saying, in light of the fact that we are no longer slaves to sin, in light of the fact that we are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, therefore, don't let sin reign in your body. Don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Instead, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. And we are to present our members as instruments of righteousness to God. The picture that Paul is painting for us here is one of a ruler that has been killed but is still trying to sit on the throne. Sin has been dealt with. We are dead to sin, but it wants the power back. It wants to sit on the throne of our lives. And at one time, it did sit on the throne. At one time, it did rule and reign with complete power and complete dominion. But now, through Christ, it has been put to death And yet it's still trying to exercise that power. It still wants to feed the flesh. Verse 12, Paul teaching, he says that we can let still sin still reign in our mortal body. He's telling you it's up to us. We don't have to, because we're no longer slaves. It no longer has the power or the authority, but we can let it. We can let it in. He even goes so far as to to share with us the result that if we choose to let sin reign, then its ultimate result is that we will obey its lust. If we let sin take the throne in our lives as believers, then we will be feeding our flesh and and the lust of sin. May it never be. There's a distinction that we need to understand that comes out here. If we're going to think rightly about this passage, we need to understand that when Paul says that we are dead to sin or that we are no longer slaves to sin, he is saying that in a spiritual sense. It it hearkens us back to to God speaking with Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And he's, he's with Adam, speaking with Adam, he says, listen, you can eat of any tree you want here in the garden, Just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day in which you eat of that tree, you shall surely, what? Die. But they ate of that tree, and they didn't drop dead. It's not a physical death. It's a spiritual one. And so when we are told here that we are dead to sin, and that we are no longer slaves to sin, that is a spiritual matter that Paul is dealing with. But in a physical sense, we can let sin still have the power. We can still let sin sit on the throne. But we got to make the change spiritually 
We have to address it on a spiritual level. And yet, when we think about that, that change and dealing with that, it's easy to fall into the trap of legalism, to, to, to be on guard against this. That, that we, we just think that we can naturally come up with a list of do's and don'ts, and here I'm going to avoid this, and I'm going to avoid that, and I'm going I'm to take care of it, and I won't fall into this, and I won't fall into that. But if that's the way in which we're trying to battle this, then we've missed the mark because the issue is a spiritual one. It is a spiritual battle that needs to be waged. We need to be growing spiritually. We need to be feeding our spiritual body so that we will not fall for the temptations of sin to feed our flesh. The question is rarely should we or shouldn't we more often than not. The appropriate question is why do we even want to? when it comes to evaluating our life. And I love, I love what comes later in Romans, in chapter 13, verse 14. What a, a beautiful encouragement. We are told to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh and its lust. Spiritually, we are new creations in Christ. We are born again. And yet this flesh, this physical body, wages war with sin and has lust. It's here that we see the real effect of our choices in the Christian life. Are we going to entertain the temptation of sin? Do we play with it? Are we going to present our body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness? Or are we going to choose something different? There's a great quote Uh, from Jerry Bridges in his book, The Discipline of Grace. I was trying to share it with some friends last night, and I completely butchered it. But it's a great quote. He says, The Bible was not given just to increase your knowledge, but to guide your conduct. The Bible is not just about getting smarter or knowing more, but it's about being transformed. It's about being changed. There comes a time when we must put into practice the things that we know to be true from God's word. I don't say this in order to to call us to some white-knuckle Christianity and say, okay, get up every morning and just just do it. Just do what's right all the time. That's not what it is. But the Christian life is one in which we say, man, I've I've read God's word. He says this. I'm going to obey him. I'm going to look to honor him with my life. James 1, 22, prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. There's an action that comes for us as believers. The second part of 1 Timothy 4, 7, he says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. There's an action involved in disciplining ourselves. Or even back in our passage in Romans 6, look again at verse 19. He says, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now, so now, this is different. You're a believer now. No longer slaves to sin. Dead to sin. So now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Sanctification is that amazing work in which God is bringing about in our life this transformation, this change in which he is making us more and more like Christ. But these scriptures seem to show us clearly that we have a role in our sanctification. That that we have a responsibility to prove ourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. That it's not enough just to come to church and hear a message or to read my Bible in the morning and just go on living the same life I've always lived. We are to be transformed. We are to present our members as slaves to righteousness, putting ourselves in those places, opportunities to please and honor God. Our part seems to be to to follow God's word, to be disciplined in spiritual matters and to present our bodies as slaves to righteousness. Our minds need to be focused on spiritual things. Our minds need to to be thinking differently. And that's why I love Romans 12 too. One of my favorite verses in all the scripture, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind 
so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, as we spend time getting to know God, as we, we understand His truths, our mind is transformed, and that leads us into living a life that proves who God is. We are to follow Him. But it's natural that when we talk about our actions, when we talk about us needing to step out and, and do something in our Christian life, the question always arises, but what about the Holy Spirit? What about the Holy Spirit? Don't worry, he's involved, primarily. But guys, what is our primary relationship with the Holy Spirit to be? It's to be one of submission. The Spirit of God is faithful to teach us, to encourage us, to comfort us, to exhort us, to guide us. But we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can avoid him. We can choose to satisfy our flesh. We are to submit our minds and our hearts and our lives to the work of the Spirit to transform us. The title of the message this morning is No Longer Slaves. And we've looked at that reality. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're dead to sin. But the reality is... We are still slaves. We are. We're slaves to righteousness. We're slaves to God. Verse 22. Having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. Sin is no longer on the throne of our lives. We should no longer live in obedience to its lust, to its desires. Instead, we are to to live as slaves to God, in obedience to Him, presenting our members to righteousness, not entertaining sinfulness, not entertaining the things of this world, but pursuing holiness, honoring him. John MacArthur in his commentary on this section of scripture summarizes it so well. He says, For those who have been freed from sin and enslaved to God through faith in Jesus Christ, the benefit is sanctification and the outcome is eternal life. In salvation, God not only frees us from sin's ultimate penalty, but frees us from its present tyranny. Freed from sin does not mean that a believer is no longer capable of sinning, but that he is no longer enslaved to sin, no longer its helpless subject. The freedom from sin about which Paul is speaking here is not a long-range objective or an ultimate ideal but an already accomplished fact. Without exception, every person who trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is freed from sin and enslaved to God. Obviously, he says, some believers are more faithful and obedient than others. But Christians are equally freed from the bondage to sin, equally enslaved to God, equally granted sanctification, and equally granted eternal life. Guys, we are no longer slaves to sin. If you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, if you have understood what he has accomplished for you, you are no longer slaves to sin. doesn't mean you won't ever sin again. It means you don't have to. It means that when you do, you need to examine yourself and, and go, what am I... What am I doing? What am I I thinking about? Why am I choosing this? Because I'm not thinking rightly about the fact that I'm dead to that. That's not who I am any longer. In light of that, look at verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, he comes into, he closes this section out with saying, man, 
God has done something amazing for you in Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. Walk in that truth. Walk in the reality that you are no longer slaves to sin. There are some points to ponder. Pastor Jason's introduced this to us. Thought I would continue on with it for you this morning. If you have the app, they're on the app, actually. But things to think about. Ask the Lord to show you this week if there are any areas in your own life that you are still living as though you were a slave to sin. Ask the Lord to search your heart. And then if there are areas where you're still living as a slave to sin, ask the Lord to show you what it means to be freed from sin and enslaved to God, which brings about our sanctification. What a beautiful thing. We are being transformed into the image of Christ. Man, I long for that day. I long for that day to see him face to face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning and for your word and for the power of your word. We ask that you would use it to to grow us. We ask that you would use it to encourage us and to challenge us and to transform us. Father, as we think about the reality that we, we are dead to sin and no longer slaves, it doesn't have that power. Father, I don't know about everyone else in here, but I know that there are times in which I, I let sin still have some power in my life. Father, I pray that, that for each of us, we would walk in the reality that, that we're not condemned to that. That we can choose to present our members as instruments of righteousness. To honor you with our lives. To be changed. Father, do this for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.